everybody. Honor your father and mother on Father's Day. I wonder what comes rushing to the front of your mind at the prospect of this next little time thinking about these things together, or what you'd prefer to kind of try and push to the back of your mind. I was honored this morning with a bowl laced with an aggressive amount of cinnamon uh, and porridge um, made by an eight-year-old. Um, there was a card that said, Happy Farters Day. <laughs> the gift was a stick of deodorants that came with an explanation, because you stink, Dad. <laughs> but then written inside the, I think we're like in sort of peak primary school humor, um, special years. Um, but inside the card was written a sincere, a sincere message. Um, they weren't trying to be funny at this point. What they said was, Dad, I'll remember you when you die. <laughs> and I was, it's, it's kind of, it was kind of funny, but I was actually deeply moved. And it's, I'm sure from, from a number of people here, poignant, you know, on Father's Day, perhaps you're missing your father. Um, and the thought that they would have the foresight to think, I'm going to remember you even when you die, um, was touching. I genuinely felt honored. We're going to be thinking tonight quite a bit about honor. Um, and we'll get on to, eventually, three aspects of what it might mean for us to honor our parents and or parental figures in our lives. For the last three years, I've lived just around the corner from my parents, who are pretty good parents, all things considered, by many measures, it should be relatively easy for me to honor them. And yet, uh, I have to confess to you, two Christmases ago, they presented um, me and Laura with one of these sort of like, you know, vouchers that's their speciality, um, homemade, probably the night before, on the printer, um, print something off. And it was for them to take us to dinner at the Boomy Kitchen in Headington. Has anyone ever been to the Boomy Kitchen in Headington? It's, I think it's opposite like the tire garage, but it's very posh, like dark green facade, gold lettering, fire things on the patio, possibly since COVID, I don't know. Um, anyway, my confession is this. It took me a full 13 months to get round to bothering to find a date and arrange a babysitter so that we could take them up on this offer, a full 13 months. It's not super honoring of me. I can confirm that the meal has taken place now um, and that the Boomy Kitchen is very expensive but very tasty, more tasty because I wasn't paying for it in that, um, on that day. But imagine by way of contrast that JD gives me a call tomorrow afternoon and she says, oh, you never guess what? Gareth Southgate has been in touch. And him and Jude Bellingham and a couple of the others are coming over to Oxford because it turns out that Jude's got this thing about having some posh Indian food uh, in between matches uh, for recovery. And do you think you can sort something out for us? I think it would take me a full 13 minutes, probably less, to cancel all of my plans, to find a babysitter, to book the best table at the Boomy Kitchen. And, um, and that's honor. <laughs> it's this sort of this natural way of operating that we fall into when we come up close with the rich and the famous or the influential or the powerful, but it can become, it can come to us a little less easily, a little less naturally, um, even with our closest relationships. Our close relationships are never easy. They're always challenging and demanding and complicated. In fact, it seems to me that they can often get more complicated with time as hurts or disappointments have this potential to, to build up. So every family is neurotic, not just yours. Every family has got its own unique blend of inherited oddness and blind spots and weirdisms and sore spots and other deficiencies. That much is standard territory. There are also tragically some more extreme and very painful family histories and situations into which this instruction, honor your parents, 
is not at all straightforward to apply, where parents have been absent or abusive, or where you've perhaps been estranged for many years, perhaps for very good reason. So it's worth saying at the outset that this call to honor your parents is not a call to just submit and accept some destructive, harmful situation, an abusive status quo. No. Actually, as hopefully we'll see, at its root, in fact, for all of these freedom rules, these Ten Commandments, for each one of them, at their roots, there's something transformative and healing and hopeful. So we're going through these, these ten words is, is, is what that first verse said. And the Lord gave them these, these words. Uh, we call them the Ten Commandments. Words, instructions, words of life, freedom rules might be better um, a better name for them. A couple of interesting things about the context of these, these ten words. This, the list appears twice in the Bible, quoted elsewhere. The first time it appears is in the scroll of Exodus. Now, when it appears in Exodus, it's not the first significant list of ten things that has appeared. Cast your mind back to the story of Exodus. Can you remember what happened? Who was it? Moses. Was there a list of ten significant things? Yes. Chapter 7, it started. It's the ten plagues in ancient Egypt. Do you remember those? The interesting thing about those plagues is that they echo some of the words and languages and ideas that are contained at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis. Track with me on this one. It's well worth it. So much so that I've made you a table. I know. So right at the beginning of the Bible, the creation accounts, this picture of flourishing abundant life. There's a river flowing through the Garden of Eden, this Garden of Paradise. It's this source of life. Order is being, a beautiful order is being made out of the chaos. Different animals are put carefully into the correct zone. The land animals, the sea animals, the sky animals. And God said, let there be light. And you've got this flourishing, abundant life. How does God bring all of this into being? How does he instate all of this beautiful order? With speaking, how many times does he speak? Ten times. Mm. So if you went through Genesis chapter 1 and you got your highlighter out, and you, every time it said, and God said, and you highlighted it, you get ten of these moments of God speaking creation into being. Okay, so you've got, suddenly you've got three lists of ten. You're thinking, maybe there's some intentionality here. Maybe the arrangement is trying to draw our attention towards something. So you lean a little bit closer, and you see absolutely that is the case. The ten plagues map very neatly as acts of de-creation. It's the undoing of the beautiful creative work. So the first plague, the river gets turned to blood. What should have been a source of life is now marked by death. You've got the frogs coming out of the water and onto the land, changing their zone, causing chaos. Instead of the light, we've got the darkness. Instead of a picture of flourishing abundant life, you've got illness. You've got flies, pestilence, locusts destroying the crops, and the final plague is death. What's the effect, if you remember, of these ten plagues with Moses? The effect is that the whole people who are living under this oppressive uh, culture with slavery, they get liberated, they get led out, and then, once they've been led out, they receive these ten new words, these ten new words of life, and they're given to them to set them up to be different to the culture that's come before. They're to be this culture that's marked by life. So, the conclusion is that these ten commandments, these ten freedom rules, these ten instructions, these ten words, are a new act of God speaking, a new act of creation, birthing a new culture, recovering life. The point is this. There is nothing diminishing or squashing or repressive or life-sucking about these instructions. They're presented to us as this recovery of life, this invitation into the freedom of God reconnecting with the source of life, actually wanting to be hosting 
something of the source. That was the calling on this people group that was set free to be something different. So it turns out that this operating system, the operating system of this new culture, is honor. If you look over the whole list of these 10 new words, and we read as far as the fifth tonight, you'll see that the first four were all about how we are to be towards God. And then this fifth one, it turns a corner and it begins to explore what it might be the implications of this new culture between, between us, between human beings. Jesus summarized the whole list by saying we're to love God and love people. On this, he said, hangs all the law and the prophets, which is shorthand for the entire Old Testament. Last week, we were looking at honoring the name of the Lord. And this week, it's, we begin thinking about honoring his image. Each and every other human being is created in the image of God. But the logic of the commandments begins at the beginning, at the scale of our closest relationships, at the place where we all started, that family unit with our parents. And parents, of course, have got this lead role in representing the image of God to their kids, to show their kids something of the goodness and the care and the love of God. And so we are instructed to recognize that, to honor that. There was a Swiss theologian in the 20th century, once upon a time, called Hansers von Balthasar, which sounds like a fairy tale from Disney, I know, but it's true. And he's one of those guys that by the end of his life had written pretty much a medium-sized library all by himself. But perhaps the most important, significant contribution of this guy's magisterial thought was this, the understanding, the observation of, of how a mother evokes love in the heart of her newborn child. So picture a mother leaning down over the cot, over the pram, making those noises, big wide eyes, smiling, singing sweet songs, letting this child know that the world is a safe place and they're wanted within it. And then after days, weeks of this exercise, this mode of being, this face-to-face -face evocation, what happens? The mother is rewarded with the first smile back and it's magic. So von Balthasar writes this. In the mother's smile, it dawns on the child that there is a world into which he is accepted and in which he is welcome. And it is in this primordial experience that he becomes aware of himself for the first time. And this. After a mother has smiled at her child for many days and weeks, she finally receives her child's smile in response. She has awakened love in the heart of her child. And what you're looking at here is what I decided to write in my Mother's Day card earlier this year, um, or possibly last year, um, to my mother. Because nothing says, thank you, mum, and I love you, like the words of a dead Swiss theologian, I find. <laughs> so you can use those if you fancy. Um, horses for courses, of course. Parents have this awesome task of awakening little human hearts to love, awakening us to the goodness, to an awareness that we exist, and that we are welcome in this world. But of course, every human parent always also fails in this task. That means we all have to forgive our parents. And maybe this is what the Spirit is saying to some of us tonight, that honoring a parent looks like moving towards forgiving them, finding a new grace for them, and perhaps finding a new freedom for ourselves in that movement. This is the first aspect of, I think, what it might mean for us to honor our parents, is that we need to forgive them. I was listening to a friend recently, a wise, mature friend, someone I respect a lot, and he was telling me how he's recently had to make the very difficult decision not to allow any longer one of his parents to come and visit the family home and connect with um, their grandchildren, his children, following this pattern of manipulative and destructive behavior. And of his situation, he, he said this, 
Honoring my parents means forgiving them and praying for them. But no one is honored by allowing the harm to continue unchecked. We are allowed to put in personal boundaries with our parents. And I would also add to that that I think he has honored his parents with a level of discretion. You know, he doesn't lead with the juicy stories of what's happened and the outrageous behavior that he's endured. In fact, it was two whole years of friendship before he began to just share with me some of this stuff. I had no idea. That's another way that he, in that, that extreme situation, can honor his parents. But we all need to forgive our parents. That's the first aspect. Someone described being a parent as being entrusted to carry around this thin, delicate, precious pane of glass. And we don't really know how to take care of this, but we try our best and the corners get a bit chipped and the scratches come and the, the chips occur over the years. I have been entrusted with three precious panes of glass. And I frequently get it wrong. This reality that we all need to forgive our parents is sobering for me. I, um, for example, one of many, when our son came, we've got two daughters and a son. When our son came along, I kind of on some basic level assumed, oh, great, I get to live my life again through this boy. And um, so off we went as soon as he could walk and talk. There I was pushing on him great opportunities, like things that little Owen would have absolutely loved, or at least I think I should have loved at that age. And the problem was he wasn't so keen on all of my ideas for, for what he should be into and enthusiastic and jumping at the chance to have a go at this, that, or whatever. Um, actually, he resisted. And so I would push a bit harder, and he'd resist a little bit harder. And then there was this tension and this friction. Uh, it was like the gears weren't quite mashed and aligned in, um, for a season. And I was reflecting on, what's, what's not quite working here? And then I, I realized, oh, hang on. Maybe we're different. <laughs> Maybe he's his own man. Maybe we're different people. Maybe my job here is not to try and make him into another, you know, shape him into another version, an extension of me somehow. But actually, my role, the gift of my role is to receive the gift of who he is, to respect him, to notice what it is that makes him tick, to give space for that, to encourage that, to follow him down some of his preferences or his predispositions. In short, I had to learn to honor him, to notice, to pay attention, to give space for him. And that is where the flourishing life is. Honor opens us up to receiving the gift of the other in our lives. That's the second thing, the second aspect of honoring. I've spoken about me towards my son, but so many of the same dynamics apply between us and our parents. When I finally made it to the Boomy kitchen, a fascinating thing happened. This posh Indian restaurant in Headington sat there, and here's what happened. I, I remembered what my mum actually looked like. Now, that's a strange thing to say. I live just around the corner from her, um, see her most weeks, but it's always so full of young children and family logistics and quick snatch teas. And perhaps we have our best conversations sometimes with a quick discussion about the garden over there. But it had been so long since I just sat down across the table from her, looked at her full in the face, asked her some questions, listened to a bit of her heart, received the gift of her smile. <laughs> kind of forgotten what she'd looked like a bit. And I was just this like, Oh, this is, this is good. <laughs> and also then, honoring my parents by sharing a bit of the challenges that I was facing and, and getting their perspective and their input and their wisdom. And I was able to receive the gift of who they are in my life as I showed up, as I paid attention, as I gave them a bit of value in that moment. It's not rocket science honor. And it is the way into a flourishing relational life. 
Is the Spirit nudging you, perhaps, to show up? If you have the opportunity to show up, take it. Did you notice it's the only one out of all of the ten words that comes with a promise attached to it, with like a bonus clause? Honor your father and your mother so that you will live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Researchers in Poland, they found that when a man has a daughter, his life expectancy increases, on average, by 74 weeks. Can you believe it? 74 weeks per daughter. That's almost three years I've just uh, got out of that. There's no such effect for having a son. (laughs) Read into that what you will. I think the point of the promise that's attached here to the fifth word, the fifth instruction, this promise of, of living long in the land, the point of it is to point us back again to the Garden of Eden. Participating in this new culture of honor, paying forward the honor to older generations, that's going to go well for you, is the logic. It's going to go well for you to be a part of that kind of culture. Honor paves the way into this flourishing relational life. So we've noted how honor might, start, might need to start for us with forgiveness, how honor opens us up to receive the gifts of other people into our lives. But thirdly, honor calls out the honorable. Proceeding with honor has this self-fulfilling way of bringing out the best in those that we honor. Check this out. It's been recorded that your IQ, the score that you're going to get on IQ tests, intelligence tests, can actually rise or fall depending on whether you've spent the last year working for a boss who values your opinion and dignifies and honors you. Your score on an IQ test is going up. Or if you've spent the last year working for a boss who doesn't really think you've got anything to offer, doesn't consult you, doesn't invite you into the conversations, and doesn't think you've got anything to contribute. Your score will go, how frightening is that? You treat someone with contempt, like they're not worth showing up for, like you're not worth listening to, not worth considering, and guess what? They're more likely to shut down and actually not have anything much to contribute to the situation. But if you treat someone with honor and respect and value, what happens is you you open them up and you bring out the best, what happens is the defensive walls of fear and insecurity come down. Those things that inhibit us and and trip us up, they come down as we are honored. We're not worrying about what they might think of us. Actually, we've got an indication that they think we're okay (laughs) and that that we've got something to contribute, and it draws out of us actually the best, and everyone benefits, everyone flourishes in these relationships of honor. Our words are so powerful in this. I had a friend who had some big stuff to overcome in his relationship with his dad. There had been um, undue pressure and unhelpful comparisons. They'd had their fights, and so much so that now any deep conversation between them was really awkward and precarious and would easily get derailed into some dangerous um, territory. But last year, he decided to write his dad a letter. Not to make a point, but the only point that he was going to make was thank you. And so he, in this careful letter, he detailed a load of things that he was grateful for in his dad. And he said, thank you for the provision. Thank you for the relative stability of our home. Thank you for that holiday. That was excellent. Thank you for being there on those birthday celebrations. Really appreciated that. He just acknowledged all the ways that his dad had kept it together, (laughs) that his dad had uh, been there for him in different ways, different, just the good that he sort of did an inventory and just came up with this two sides of A4 letter. And the effect for him of writing these better words down on a piece of paper, sticking it in an envelope, 
putting it in the post. I don't think he could have done it in a face-to-face -face conversation. It was too awkward, precarious. It wasn't kind of safe or easy for that to happen. But stepping backwards, writing that letter, putting it in the post, it's had a profound effect. He doesn't regret it for one minute. Some of the relational debris that was caught between them has been cleared. Some of the ice has melted. It is safer as they have conversations now. His father has responded well to this this expression of gratitude, which is an expression of honor. Maybe there are ways that you could speak a better word into a situation and then see what happens. The final thing to say before we come around this table is that even when our parents have let us down badly or not been there at all or perhaps a no longer with us. When on a day like today, we are hurting, even then, and perhaps especially then, there remains over you and for you the perfect love of your heavenly Father. Maybe you feel like you're outside the restaurant, outside the boomy kitchen, and you're looking in through the window, and you just wish there was someone that you had to sit with and talk to and show up for. And that isn't an easy prospect for you for whatever the reason is. Here's the truth. The wonderful truth is that Jesus himself comes running out of that restaurant. And if you imagine that I would be excited to see Gareth Southgate and Jude Bellingham and to have a meal with them, how much more deeply pleased is Jesus to scoop you up and welcome you in to his family. The truth is that our faith does not turn on the success or failure of our biological families. The truth is our faith turns on the embrace of Jesus Christ. That's what we're celebrating. That's the rock. That's our ground zero. That's where we start. That's where we find all the resources we need to have a chance at any of the other stuff. And that's what we're going to celebrate now.